So let's kick off this evening and I will start in an unusual way for myself. Um, uh, I think it was yesterday I was sending Ugi a message about uh, something that we have been discussing in Red Robes or what I brought up in Red Robes regarding the using Red Robes, our shawls our um, external mark of a practitioner in public to increase the visibility of uh, uh, let's say con contemplative practice or yogic practice or specifically tantric practice here where we live and uh, as i was dictating that voice message to ugi uh, i came to think of Shakyamuni Buddha and how he met the Dharma and um, there is a traditional account of how the Buddha found the Dharma and I found one source that tells the story it's a three pages long text that I will now read to you so unusual to myself I will read something as an introduction to give context for for this topic so take a good posture and uh, just listen how the buddha found the dharma uh, so shakyamuni buddha's name before he was called shakyamuni buddha was uh, siddhartha siddhartha gautama so he was a prince and his father the king is named Sudhodhana. Uh, so before I start reading it, I should explain a little bit that so King Sudhodhana, uh, this princess Siddhartha's father, he was very protective about his son because uh, when Shakyamuni was born, uh, there were some uh, yogis, ascetics, who, who came and told the king that his son would become a yogi, a practitioner, and the king didn't want that because he wanted his kingdom to be taken over by a male heir. So that's why the king, what he did was that he made the princess life extremely comfortable inside the palace, and Shakyamuni, Shakyamuni Buddha Siddhartha, the prince, he wasn't allowed to leave the palace area, according to the legend, according to the story. So he grew up in there in the in the palace, um, you know, having everything he wanted, everything he needed. <clears throat> and um, um, so now I'll start reading. All the diversions. All the diversions provided by King Sudodhana did not prevent the prince feeling bored and restless. And one day he summoned his charioteer and personal attendant, Channa, to take him for a drive in the countryside. Channa chose four or five horses of the fav famed Sindhi breed, white and spotless like lotus blooms, and harnessed them to a magnificent chariot. Siddhartha took the rain, reins majestic and resplendent as a god. They had not gone far before they saw standing in the roadway a hunched up, tired looking old man. At last the precautions taken by the king had failed. Siddhartha was astonished. By the way, I'll pause for a moment just to say that you know, this is the story that is told of about Siddhartha or Shakyamuni Buddha in the Theravada tradition. So, if at some point you hear something funny, <laughs> you know, uh, like some things from this text might sound funny because we are tantrics. We are not followers of the Theravada or Hinayana vehicle. Um, okay, I'll go back to the text. What is that? he asked Chana, bringing the horses to a stop. It looks like a man, but his hair is all white, he has no teeth, his cheeks are sunken, 
His skin is dry and wrinkled, and his eyes are bleary. Look at his bent back, his ribs protruding, his thin crooked arms and legs that seem as if they can hardly support his wretched frame, so that he has to lean on a stick. What kind of a man is that? That, replied Chana, apparently making little effort to sustain the elaborate structure of pretense that had shielded Siddhartha from reality up till then, is an old man. It is someone who has been living for a long time, perhaps 60, 70 or even 80 or more years, so that his body is worn out and decaying. It is nothing to be dismayed about at, since it is a common thing. We all get old. Do you mean to say that we, that we, all of us, become like that? That we all get old, said the prince. That Yasodhara and you and all my youthful companions and even I myself must one day look like that. Yes, my lord, answered Chana. It is everyone's lot. Siddhartha was so upset that he could not go on with his drive. Instead, he turned the horses around and went back to the palace, deep in thought, too troubled to speak. When the king saw his son returning so soon after setting out, he asked Chana the region. And when he heard it, he cried out in despair, Now you have destroyed me. But the king was not one to give up so easily. In an effort to remove from Siddhartha's mind the memory of his meeting with the old man, he ordered special dramas and amusements to be provided. He also doubled the guard around the palace grounds and reminded everyone of the strict, strict instructions he had issued regarding uh, guarding the prince from external influences. But once again, Siddhartha decided to go for a chariot ride with Chana, and on this occasion they encountered a man who was ill. He was so weak he could not stand, but rolled and writhed on the ground. His eyes were bloodshot, his mouth was frothing, and he groaned and beat his breast in agony. As before, Chana explained the phenomena, and once more Siddhartha was overcome with anxiety. Is this a rare thing, or does it happen to everybody, he asked. asked. Everybody is liable to get ill, my lord, replied Chana, then added by way of reassurance. But if a man is careful about his diet, keeps clean, and take, takes plenty of exercise, he is like to, likely to remain healthy. There is no need to worry. No need to worry, ex exclaimed the prince. First I see the horror of decay and old age, and now it seems everyone is liable to find himself in such a wretched plight as this man. As before, they got short their excursion, and Siddhartha returned home with a heavy heart. A third time Siddhartha and Channa set out, and this time came upon a funeral procession. The mourners were wailing and beating their breasts, while in contrast the corpse they were carrying lay still and lifeless like a statue. Channa replied to Sid Siddhartha's predictable questions and then went on. Death, my lord, is the end of life. When life ceases, that is death. Your body dies when it can go on no longer because of old age and decay. Or else it dies because of disease. Breathing stops and the heart ceases to beat. But there is nothing strange about it. It is as common as birth, for everyone who lives must sooner or later die. There is nothing you can do about it, since it is in the nature of things, so there is no point in worrying about it. Just hope for a long life. Siddhartha pondered this, and also the two earlier phenomena, and came to realize that these unpleasant facts, which had been hidden from him for so long, 
thanks to the misguided concern of his father, represented the true nature of existent, existence. Life was suffering, and then he began to wonder whether there was not some way out of this dilemma, some means of escape. Must everyone I love, and I myself too, simply endure helplessly this tyranny of old age, disease and death, he asked himself, as they once more drove back to the palace. Siddhartha and Channa when, went out a fourth and last time, and as before, an unaccustomed sight awaited Siddhartha on the roadside. But this time it was not a scene of despair. It was a man with a shaven head, wearing an orange-colored robe that glowed with the mellow light of the morning sun, standing barefoot and holding a bowl in his hand. His face bore a calm, thoughtful expression, and his gaze was directed downwards, as if he was a person at peace engrossed in pleasant thoughts. Halting his horses, Siddhartha asked Channa, Who is this? Is it a man or is it indeed a god who stands there so calm and aloof, as if the sorrows and joys of this world do not touch him? That, my lord, replied the dutiful Channa, is an ascetic. It is a man who has seen how old age disease and death afflict all beings, and has renounced the world to, to seek a solution to the enigma of life. He has no home but shelters in caves and woods, begging enough food for one frugal meal a day, and living a life of discipline and simplicity, striving to be pure in deed, word and thought, and seeking deliverance from the world's suffering through meditation. He travels from place to place and tries to tell people how to live a good life and find happiness. This was, of course, the fourth symbolic vision foretold by the Brahmins. Greatly impressed, Siddhartha did not this time turn back, but drove on deep in thought until he reached the amusement park that had been the destination of all his excursions with Channa. In the park, everything had been prepared for the prince's entertainment, with musicians, dancers, poets and scholars all waiting to attend him, and plenty of food and drink. But Siddhartha would not be distracted from his train of thought, and as he walked through the park so richly provided, with possibilities of indulgence and diversion, he thought to himself, I must become like that ascetic. I too shall renounce the world this very day and seek that deliverance from suffering of which I have been unaware through all the years I have spent in superficial amusements. Eventually, tired of walking, he sat down in the shade of a tree. While he was thus resting, a messenger galloped, galloped up on a foaming steed with an announcement that should have delighted the young prince. His wife, Princess Yasodhara, had just given birth to a son. But far from feeling joy, Siddhartha greeted the news with dismay. Another bond to tie me he exclaimed as he arose to return to the palace. But this resolve remained unshaken. Nothing, not even the arrival of a son and heir, would not deflect him from the path he had chosen. So, <clears throat> the reason why I wanted to read that, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? <laughs> in the in the light of visibility of dharma and it is interesting intriguing to think that 
if he had not seen someone wearing a robe, there would be no Buddhism. So one thing leads to another, and that thing leads to another, and you know, um, in such a way, all things are connected, karmically connected. So um, I think that uh, again we haven't had a formal ceremony for lay ordination in Pemako Buddhism. Uh, again, for the reason that uh, I or we haven't still figured out the exact form of it and <clears throat> what it would include, like I was saying in that discussion a few days ago in our Facebook group. But uh, as this story came to me when I was dictating that message to Ugi, I realized that there is. There it is. There it really is. You know, if we think of people, uh, like I've spoken several times about it already, you know, and, and you also know this because you have to said the same thing that when we go out, outside, you know, we can feel this pain. And if we, even if we didn't leave our homes, we can feel that there is so much pain and existential anguish everywhere around us. And also we know our own pain that, uh, you know, we should do our best and utmost to try to alleviate that. So, <clears throat> you know, to use those, uh, those four indicators that for events that Siddhartha the prince uh, experienced or met with, uh, people know about sickness, old age and death here. Even though, well, death is a bit of a taboo. Uh, death is not even nearly as visible uh, here in the West as it is still in the East. You know, there are still the cremation grounds on the bank of Ganges and, and um, you know, the cemeteries are very different there. Uh, and there are sky burials and stuff like this, so so the bodies are actually chopped to pieces with huge knives by these uh, sky burial uh, priests or whatever they are called. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, people over here, it's it's been my concern for a long time that Dharma is not visible, and I think that's a problem. That's a really, really big problem, and it should be visible. And that's why, you know, remembering <clears throat> this story of Siddhartha that made the prince see a practitioner, a meditator, a yogi, who was wearing the external mark of a practitioner while also radiating peace radiating calmness and clarity <clears throat> you know it kind of went click in my head and i decided that of course you know we should also wear our robes uh, in our lives in our everyday lives having said that like i've said again it's a recommendation it's not a black and white rule so uh, again if if you think, if you experience some conflicts that arise because of that with your friends, with your family members, relatives, uh, possibly workmates, then of course, you know, it's, it's not, uh, we are not creating dogmatic rules here. Uh, raising eyebrows is, is okay, and that is to be expected. Some people raise their eyebrows. Also, when I, when I uh, travel, when I always wear a robe or a rakusu, you know, some people are kind of watching that. What is that? You know, raising eyebrows a little bit. 
But like I said before, there are always, always people who um, ask me about it. And that is interesting. Every single time I've flown to UK um, or Ireland to teach the past few years, wearing a rakus or a robe, every time somebody has come to ask about it, and then it's a mission accomplished. And even if they didn't come to ask, even if they saw that, oh, what is that? That is enough. Then the Dharma, then practitionership is visible to people around us. So <clears throat> those are my personal experiences. We have now our ordained Sangha is uh, 13 plus 1, plus 1 myself and 13 of all of you. So imagine the ripple effect of that. Imagine how um, you know, 13 people who have felt that restlessness and nervousness and, and have the sense of being lost in life because it is all suffering out there. Imagine 13 people seeing you wearing a robe. Imagine them realizing that there is an option. So that's what I wanted to say here in the beginning. So um, yes, uh, from now on, according to your uh, life situation, like I explained, I would like you to ask to wear robes. And if you need time to consider it, to get used to the idea, idea please contemplate. So. Nobody's pushing you, I'm not pushing you, this is not a dogmatic rule, but um, yeah, we should do something about it. This is bodhicitta in action. That's the way how I see it. So, uh, thank you for listening that short lecture. Uh, it felt actually good reading that text. Maybe I should start doing it more because <laughs> it's kind of easier to introduce stuff reading reading stories and teachings from books 